My name is Joni Degner. I'm a, a UDL facilitator at BCSC. I'm also a, a member of the CAS professional learning cadre and a professional learning provider, uh, an instructional designer, like, I'm, I'm, like, like you name it, and I'll, and I'll do some of it. Um, but I, um, today, I want to um, talk with you guys a little bit about um, extending our intentionality. Um, as um, people who embrace the UDL framework, certainly intentionality is something that we talk about and being proactive is something that we talk about. Um, and it is um, possible to extend the intentionality that we give to um, the design of our instruction and the design of our, of our spaces to um, the way that we connect with learners. And it is possible um, to, to um, design the relationships that we have with our learners. So um, before we get started then, um, one of the things I want to talk about is the thing that actually brings us all here to this place together, and that's UDL. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about what UDL is, but I'm going to talk about some of the things I really, really love about this framework. Um, and one of those things is that UDL over the years has fundamentally changed the way I see myself as an educator, the possibilities for my career as an educator, but also it has fundamentally changed the way I see learners and learning. Um, it really has um, like, 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 um, propelled um, my thinking from, you know, like, like it's really important for kids to acquire information to it's really important to think about like what kind of learners are we, are we growing um, and are we really like raising innovators um, and strategic thinkers and kids who are goal directed and resourceful. So I really love that it has fundamentally changed those parts of me as an educator. Um, I also really love that um, UDL came along for me at a time when um, I felt like every April I kind of started wondering if I really still had what it takes to be an educator. Like every April, like right around this time, I'd start thinking like, eh, I don't know, this could be your last year, Joni. Like, might be time to look at the one I'd ask. And I would do it, like, the, for, like for several years in a row. Like I would go and look and then, you know, like then, then summer would get here and I'd have enough of a break and I'd think like, nah, okay, I'm good, I'm good, I got it, I can, I can go for another year. And on and on it would go. And so it was at a time uh, that, that I was really starting to question whether or not I had what it took to still be an educator when UDL came along and it really kind of transformed things for me. And it made me realize that um, it's not that I didn't have what it takes to be an educator, um, it's that I didn't have the right approach. Right, that I, that I didn't maybe have the right value system, and those are things that UDL gave to me. Um, and the last thing that I, can't, that I cannot leave out is I have two little boys who are six and 10 who go to school in the district where I'm a UDL facilitator, and I have seen how incredibly rich it has made their learning. I have a kindergartner who talks about being an expert learner. Uh, I have a, a fifth grader who keeps a learner scrapbook um, that is a growth model where he tracks his own strategies that are working for him and, and, and identifies goals like, hey, I really, really want to be a more fluent reader. Like, I want to be able to read more fast. And so he develops strategies and tracks his progress with his teacher. And it's like that to me has been mind blowing. But it's also been like I've been so, so grateful to the things that the UDL framework has done for me. And so for as much as I love it, it's just like everything. Well, there are still, certainly still some things, like you could probably say that you, that, that you wish were different. And so for me sometimes, when you start thinking about um, various aspects of, of, of instructional design, there's no doubt that like, our, the, the framework is, it has like some missing pieces to it. And you really can't ignore that. And so, um, for instance, when I think about, and this is the piece that I'm focusing on in the talk today, when I think about relationships, and the relationships that we develop with learners, the reality is there's no guideline here that really talks about here's how to get intentional about that. Now certainly when we look at the, the engagement guidelines, we talk about like, um, you know, eliminating threats and distractions. We talk about like building value and building relevance. Uh, I mean, that really kind of starts to get there. We talk about you know, helping kids uh, develop their coping skills and mechanisms. The truth is like, that's kind of getting there, but it's never really talked about in terms of relationships. And the truth is, relationships are absolutely critical to, to our learners, but also to teachers. So we're gonna talk about like the incentives for developmental relationships on both of those ends. So most people would probably agree with me, I think, if I said like, hey, relationships with your learners are important. 
probably most people would say, mm, yeah, I agree with that. Even if it's to a certain degree, I agree with that. So the Search Institute, which is a research um, organization out of, um, out of Minnesota, um, has put out some research, and this is one of their findings in their research. Uh, and I'm going to be touching on quite a bit of the research today to kind of introduce you to this, this framework for developmental relationships, but also some of the, the, the research that drives it. So one of the things that they found in the research is that middle school students who reported high levels of developmental relationships with their teachers were eight times more likely to stick with challenging tasks, to enjoy working hard, and to know that it's okay to make mistakes in your learning compared to kiddos who did not have those developmental relationships. And you know, I think a lot of times we think about like having great relationships with kids, we think about, like, well, if I have a good relationship with a kid, they'll do work for me, right? If I have a good relationship with my kids, then it's like smooth sailing, like smooth seas, right? Like everybody might be like compliant or like it's easy to get, like, like that's my classroom management, right? But when you think about how much richer it actually is, when you think about developmental relationships can actually change the trajectory of a student's life. When you think about a kiddo being willing to take on challenges, like to stick with something even when it's hard, that is something that can change your trajectory in life. When you talk about the, the possibility of actually enjoying hard work, versus being afraid of it or apathetic to it. That's something that can change your trajectory in life. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, how, how, like, in, how critical these are, but then also like, okay, so how do we do it? So you've probably heard things like this. Like I see things about relationships all the time. I'm all over Twitter and I'm always on Instagram and I see things all the time. These are some of the things that like have kind of resonated and that I keep seeing over and over again. And there's this fantastic quote from James Comer where he says, no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. And that has been repeated in TED Talk after TED Talk after TED Talk. And it's actually Rita Pearson who did her, her um, TED Talk on um, every kid deserves a champion when she said, you know, kids don't learn from people they don't like. And the truth is, like, I, I always thought that was like, it was so blunt, but it was also quite beautiful. And the truth is, like, <laughs> and I've just credited this to like, every inspirational like, like, quote that's posted on, on, on Twitter and Instagram around education, people talk about relationships being first quite frequently. And when we look at the, the, you know, the, the redesign of the UDL framework, I mean, there's a reason that, that it, that, that they moved the, 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 the engagement uh, principle as being the, the, the first principle that you see on the, on the framework. And there's a reason for that. And so what you might not realize, though, is that like, as, as much as these things are important, you might not realize why they're important. And it's not just because, like, well, kids will do work for me, right? The truth is, meaningful connections foster what I would say is arguably the most important trait our kids could leave us with, and that's resilience. The ability to get back up when you feel like your teeth have been knocked in and to try again. To feel like you are absolutely bloodied in the, the arena and to be willing to go back in the arena. It's really, really an important thing that our kids need to be able to do, to say, I got my butt kicked, but I'm not afraid to try again. It's a really important, it's a really important characteristic for our kiddos to have. But there's also something in it for teachers, which I think is important because we're at, teachers are asked to do a lot. And I don't think that you're, you're, um, you're remiss to ask, well, what's in it for me? Why should I do this? What we also know is that meaningful connections with our learners fight what I would say is also probably the number one like, teacher killer, the number one deflator of our teachers, and that's student apathy. Feeling like kids don't care and that you can't do anything about it. And so these meaningful connections don't just boost our students and give them resilience, that, you know, this, this critical piece that they need when they leave us, but they also boost teacher efficacy. Because when you have meaningful connections with your learners, it's your number one way to combat student apathy. You don't have to worry about fighting with, you know, that, that I don't care syndrome that we feel like our kids bring to class with them sometimes. Because when kids have meaningful connections, they're not apathetic to the learning. So we know that, that relationships are really important, no doubt. I think the research is there to suggest it. 
But the research is also there to suggest we've got a lot of work to do. When the Search Institute um, surveyed more than 120,000 students nationwide, the results that they found around a couple of questions that they asked were actually quite dismal when they looked at the responses. So if you look at the, at the, uh, if you look at the data, and I'm really just kind of looking at the blue ring line right now, that in sixth grade, nationwide, just over one third of our kids said, I have a teacher who really cares about me. And you can see that that is a steep and consistent decline into 12th grade when just 16% of kids nationwide said, I have a teacher who really cares about me. So to me, that's a heartbreaking statistic because I would bet that all of you, you're in education in some way or an instructional decline in some way. So my guess is all of you could probably identify somebody who had a huge impact on you and who was an educator to you in some way, whether it was a coach or a mentor or a, or a, a you know, more traditional classroom teacher. I bet that each of you could identify at least one who said that person had a huge impact on me. The relationship that they extended to me had a huge impact on me. And our kiddos today are finding that more and more the older they get, and as you go from sixth grade to 12th grade, the world gets bigger, right? You become smaller and the world gets bigger. So at a time when kids need it most, it's when we find that they have it the least. So while we know it's important, we've got a lot of work to do. And again, when I said like, well, the truth is like developmental relationships with students don't just benefit teachers or don't just benefit our students. I think it's interesting to look at this because the Search Institute says, well, students with more developmental relationships with their teachers, and they say, like, here are the benefits to students, that students have higher grade point averages, that students feel more connected to school, that students feel culturally respected and included, and that they rate the instruction they receive as high quality. So it's interesting to me because the Search Institute lists those as these are the benefits to students. But I would argue that aren't those probably some of the key elements that make up teacher efficacy? Right? Students feeling connected to school, like they want to be here. They want to be in my learning environment. Their level of success. I mean, those are things that as a teacher I feel I own. Right? That I have a part in. They help make up what I think of myself as an educator. So while they list these as benefits to students, I would say like you're actually, I mean, you're building your own self-efficacy in this. So you've heard me use the term developmental relationships a couple of times. There are a few infographics laying around so you can see them right in front of you, but I'll also show you that the Search Institute identifies five elements of a developmental relationship. So those five elements are expressing care, challenging growth, providing support, sharing power, and expanding possibilities. So as you look at these five elements, and again, you know, I, ta I, sta I started this talk by saying, here are some of the things I really love about UDL. Well, one of the things that I really love about UDL is that because it does kind of present itself not just as a, a framework for instruction, but also kind of like as a value system, is that we feel like when, it, when, we, ha when we have something that, that has that sort of design to it, it makes it very easy to identify other pieces of our value system that it connects with. And so as I look at some of these elements, I think like I can find places that these live in the UDL framework. So one of the things that, that, that it's, it's critical to understand about developmental relationships is that we know that relationships develop naturally and over time, right? So we're not trying to like force a relationship because we know that those most often don't work and they don't feel authentic, right? So while we don't want to force it and we do want it to develop naturally over time, we don't want to approach it with some intentionality. And so for some people, I have lots of people who will tell me like, well, I'm a relationship person. Like my kids love me. I love my kids like they know I love them. I have lots of people who say that to me and I was the same way. And so what I would say to that is like, so that means that some of these pieces are intuitive to you. 
that for some of us, uh, especially when I think about like expressing care and challenging growth, like for me, I think about those as like, well, isn't that part of the job description of being an educator? But some of the other pieces require a bit more intentionality, right? When you really think about like providing support, well, do I provide support to kids um, who show it that they need it the most? Because some kids who need support don't show that they need support. And if I share power with my students, do I share power with all of my students? Because some of them make it easier to share power with them, right? And if I'm expanding possibilities for my students, right? If I'm connecting them with people and places that will really help broaden their world and connect them to things that, 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 will, that will expand their future, like, am I doing that for all kiddos? Or is it maybe sometimes easier to do it with the ones that, like, that we have some common interests? Or you perceive that you're a little bit more like me? So certainly, we know that some pieces of this are intuitive. But there are also some pieces of this that really take some intentionality. And so the Search Institute um, it, it defines these relationships these developmental relationships as not just being nice, right? Nice is like we have a positive relationship, we're civil with each other, right? That keeps the waters all calm, you do the things I ask you to do, very easy. So it's like a nice relationship. Developmental relationships progress over time to become necessary. Those relationships that really build resilience in our learners. So as we look at that continuum of going from nice to necessary, it really does also kind of match up with like the things that we do intuitively to the things we start building intentionally. Right? So these are the five elements that make up a developmental relationship. But it's important to note that not every relationship is developmental. Like you're not going to be all things to all kids. But if lots of the adults in our learners' lives are embracing this kind of an approach, to developing relationships, then what that means is they're more likely to find that developmental relationship, right? You're not gonna be all things to all kids. You're not expected to be. But every person in your school, every person no matter their role, can be a developmental relationship for a kid. So, when I look at the, the desired outcomes, the things that the Search Institute identifies, like these are the things that happen for kids when they have developmental relationships. And I'll be honest with you, I see UDL in everything. So like every piece of research that somebody brings to me, every design somebody brings to me, every new book they bring to me, everything they bring to me, I try and think about like what are the connections to what I already know. Because I do use UDL as kind of like my value system for, for instructional design. So when people bring extra, like additional pieces to me, like to address the other pieces that might be missing from the framework, I have to look at, does that, does it coincide with the value system that UDL has, has given me? And for me, when I look at these outcomes and the way they connect with the qualities of the expert learner, to me, the qualities of the expert learner are the things that give the UDL framework its staying power, right? Because it focuses on the right thing, developing the right kind of learners. And so as I look at this and I look at like how this coincides, how their outcomes coincide with the qualities of the expert learner, to me it becomes a no-brainer when the outcomes are clear. And we want kids to be able to discover who they are. We want kids to be able to develop abilities that shape their own lives. And we want them to learn how to engage and contribute to the world around them. And so when I think about those and how they connect with those qualities of the expert learner, it makes me feel like, well, maybe this is the missing piece. Like this is the, like the, this is the powerful partner for universal design for learning. That if we really want to get intentional about design and get intentional about all pieces of design, that maybe this is that partner that really kind of propels our intentionality into all parts of design. And so if you are someone who is looking at this, the, the developmental relationships framework and say like, well, I, yeah, I, already, I already do that. The thing then that, that becomes the next step is probably one of the steps that you took in UDL implementation or maybe one that you're thinking about taking. And that is that, that if you're saying I already do that, it's really important to ask yourself, do you do that for all learners? Do we do that for all learners? 
And again, that was probably a question that, that somebody posed to you when you were kind of getting into UDL and you said, but you know, I think I'm like, kind of already doing some of this. It's really important to push on yourself so that you continue to grow as a practitioner. So ask yourself, do I do that for all learners? And so when we're talking about like, expanding possibilities and really extending the, the developmental relationship to every kid, what we really are talking about is uh, the, 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 uh, the, the steps that we're gonna take, that we have to take in acknowledging and confronting implicit bias. Because certainly, it, as we said, like, certainly it's easier to extend relationships to some kids than it is to others. And for some, it's because they're ready to come to a relationship with an educator, right? So like, they're, like it's like, here I am, right? Care about me, challenge me, like, I'm, I'm ready. Other kids don't feel that way. That doesn't mean that we don't extend it to them. Because we always have to be ready when they're ready to come along, right? So we talk about implicit biases, it's really important to understand implicit biases are not like evil. It's, and, and we all have them. There's really great research that comes out of the Kerwin Institute at Ohio State University around implicit bias. And they, they, they publish a new study every year. And it's really, really valuable information. And they look at implicit biases in lots of different settings, but they also focus on education. So this is not an exhaustive um, definition um, from, from their study, but it, it's, it's some critical pieces that come out of their study. So the implicit biases are, are unconscious attitudes um, that affect our understanding, our actions, and our decisions. They're actually shortcuts that our brain takes. And it's, a, it's because our, our brain looks at like certain pieces and it identifies what's familiar to me and then makes assumptions about it. And the truth is that we like what's familiar. How many of you have ever been to a concert and been really disappointed like when they play a new song? You're like, what's this crap? <laughs> play something we know. And then they play something you know and you're like, yes. Even if you don't know, even if you don't like it, like you know it. We like what's familiar. We like what's familiar. So we all have this impl these implicit biases. And some people call them unconscious biases because it's not your rational thinking mind that makes those decisions and, and, and drives that action. It literally is your brain making a shortcut. So it's not like you thinking it through and then making that judgment. It's your brain making that judgment without you really quite realizing it. A lot of times our implicit biases don't necessarily align with our declared beliefs. Like you can be somebody who's like a social justice advocate. Like I've made my life being a social justice advocate. And yet you go in and you start taking some implicit biases, you know, tests and finding out like, well, okay, so I need to like, like acknowledge and kind of confront what these are. And you find out like, oh my gosh, like uh, I actually have like some like implicit biases that deal with race. And here I am, like I'm, I'm a social justice advocate and I've made my whole living doing that. That happens all the time. So your implicit biases don't necessarily align with your declared beliefs, right? Because again, it's not your rational thinking mind making those decisions. But those implicit biases do cause us to favor our in-group, those people we perceive to be like us. So the good news is that our brains are malleable. We know that. So for as much as we have lived and breathed the implicit biases that we've developed without even realizing it, the good news is we can, we can change the way that, that our brains uh, make decisions. So I want to talk about, though, like, like that's what implicit bias is. Well, how does it show itself in a classroom? And the truth is, like these examples that I'm talking about, they're actually very subtle. They're very subtle, things that we might not think about. So my implicit biases affect the, the way I'm willing to give eye contact to some of my students. It affects my body language around some students. It affects um, my proximity. I might favor one side of the room more than another, or the front of the room more than the back, right? Um, it, it also affects the, the way that I, that I um, extend parent contact and family engagement and extend opportunities to my kids. It also affects like really like basic menial stuff like my, my willingness to give you a hall pass or a pass to the bathroom or an extension on a deadline. Like that I give it to some kids and not all. 
based on my perception of what kind of person they are, right? based on my implicit biases. And so it really is those shortcuts that kind of drive some of this everyday behavior and these everyday decisions around our students. And so it's really, really important to think about, do, do I give more hall passes like to these sorts of students versus these kinds of students? Uh, do I give extensions on deadlines like to, to these kinds of kids versus these kinds of kids? Because sometimes our implicit biases are so wrong. For example, if I don't give the extension, to, uh, the deadline extension to a kid who has slept in my class several times, I might think that he's sleeping because well, I guess you're like lazy or apathetic, right? Why would I give you an extension? Whereas the, the student who really seems like they're, they're in it and they're like busting their butt, but the truth is like they actually don't do a lot of work. Like they just know how to kind of play school. Like they know how to display the right behaviors. When you think about like who am I more likely to extend the, 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 like the, the, the deadline to, it's probably going to be the student like who's behaving and showing me the behavior that I want, right? But that's implicit bias driving that. That's implicit bias driving it. So in thinking about intentionality and intuition, I always think of, of I, when I think about developmental relationships and the idea of designing a relationship, I really think about this in terms of like the way that I came to UDL and the way a lot of people come to UDL, which is looking at the framework and saying, well, I think I'm already doing some of this. And then inevitably somebody, a consultant or a coach or an administrator or a, a facilitator says like, uh, are you really like, so let's, let's kind of talk about that a little bit. Like, are you really doing it for all students? And like, like, is it really choices or like, I mean, like you start having those conversations and kind of pushing in on yourself. And that as you start identifying, well, these are the things I do intuitively that really are like aligned with universal design, then I start extending intentionality, right? Well, like, so what are some things I'm not doing that would really make learning work more for my kids? And you start like digging more into the framework and extending your intentionality. And we can take that same approach to the way that we develop relationships with our learners. Like, we can look at like, well, what are the things that I'm already doing? Like, I might be a person who expresses care and challenges my, my kiddos. But I also have to think about, like, well, what are those other three pieces? Like, is it possible then for me to think about, like, how I'm providing support? Is it possible for me to think about, like, how I share power with all of my students? Is it possible for me to, like, to extend into, like, how I extend possibilities for all of my students? And once I'm doing that, to really think about, am I doing it for all students? Because again, it's not just about like, things being positive and civil. We're talking about building resilient learners, combating student apathy, and boosting teacher efficacy. And so we can do that if we extend the intentionality that we give to instructional design and space design into the way that we design relationships with our kiddos. Thank you guys so much.